And I would like for us to please welcome Dr. Mark Hartlob. He is the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts. He's going to speak to us this morning about best practices for teaching and setting up our courses. And Mark, how long have you been teaching for TAMUCC? It's over 20 years, right? 22 years. 22 years. So he knows a thing or two about teaching. So Mark, thank you for joining us this morning. I am going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, well, hello, everybody. Yeah, I know uh, probably what you're thinking is uh, why, why have a, an administrator talk to us uh, about uh, teaching? Uh, as Kelly said, I've been a faculty member here for uh, 22 years, been in administration uh, at least part time for the last 10. Um, and then I was teaching for a good 10 years uh, before that. So and I've done a lot of thought about teaching and, you know, from the dean's perspective, I kind of see it from a different uh, perspective in terms of, yes, there's uh, the teaching that needs to be done, etc. But then there's also sort of as an administrator, some of the uh, challenges that I see and, you know, as a department chair and I was a department chair for three years. And as a dean, kind of how do I look at teaching and, you know, if there's struggles uh, in the classroom, how can we best handle those, et cetera? So, all right, let me begin with the um, presentation here. Uh, I think I've figured this out. Let's see. All right, everybody, uh, right? You're seeing that? Good. Okay, good. All right, so this is really a little bit about uh, syllabi setup and academic resources. Uh, Kelly. Uh, has a copy of this or she will have a copy of this and she can share it. So you obviously didn't no need to, uh, you know, furiously write everything down. Um, all of this will be shared and this is really again. I'm just going to kind of talk about some of the. Uh, challenges that faculty members face and some of the resources that really are available on campus uh, for teaching. So. Um, First of all, we're very, very happy that you're here. This is the oddest of years, uh, certainly the oddest of my 22 years. Uh, I wish we could be doing this in person. We're not, uh, but we're very, very happy that you're here. We're happy that you have joined us. Uh, we think that we've really got something special here in South Texas, so we're really happy that you're here. Uh, most of the faculty that have been here a very, very long time, uh, one of the things that keeps them here are the students that we've got. You know, We really have the opportunity to teach. Um, I actually was looking for a very, very old photograph, which I could not find of me when I graduated from college. And it's a nice little picture of my mother and my father and me. That's it. Okay. Those pictures actually are fairly rare here. These are the pictures that we have every time that we have graduation. And you have to kind of dig in the picture to find who the graduate is. Why? Because we really change lives here. We change families. And you know, aunts and uncles and grandparents and cousins and nieces and nephews, they all come out for the graduation. And it's really, really a big deal. And for many of these students, it's the first one in their family to get a college degree. We take that very, very seriously and really honored to do that. You will be evaluated here, uh, you know, just like every other place on three criteria, teaching, scholarship and creative activity and service. Those are the three. And so teaching is a big one. And so that's what I'm really talking about is, you know, what can we do to make teaching the best that it can and also really the best for the student and the student experience. And so that's the first one. Take it seriously. Teacher teaching is valued here. I know there are places. In fact, you may have just graduated recently from a place where teaching really is not that important. Um, you know, scholarship and research and how much money you bring in. That's really what's most important. Um, we, we are not that place. Uh, so teaching is it's valued here. Uh, so please do take it seriously. This is not something that oh, yeah, I kind of have to do some teaching while we're doing these other things. Uh, we really value everything. And so we hope that you take it seriously. We are a regional university, as you know, our unique student body. Um, you know, we are part of the A&M system. Um, there's lots of different models around the country. I mean, I, you know, I assume that you know this or investigated this, but we're part of the A&M system, like people that are part of the UT system, like part of the Cal State system, like part of the SUNY system in New York, et cetera. But we are not a branch campus of A&M. There's A&M College Station and there's A&M Corpus Christi. They're not the same. Yes, we answer to the same chancellor, but 
you know, they're the Aggies and we're the Islanders, so it's not the same. Our student body, they are humble, grateful, and unsure. That's how I would characterize them. Um, one word you're not going to see there is entitled. Um, our students are not entitled. Our students are not the kind that are say, you know, you better do this for me or I'll give you a bad evaluation and you'll be fired. Uh, we, we, don't, we don't have students like that. I've heard horror stories of faculty that come here from other places and that's what they say, but we, we do not have that. Um, our students are very, very thankful to be getting the education that they're getting. They're very thankful that there is a, you know, there's a nice university right here in town where they can take classes uh, and they're unsure. They're unsure about what they're doing. They're unsure about what they can do. Um, one of the things that many of our, our faculty members are very interested in, and we'll say it on the syllabus, if you are struggling in this class, please see me before you drop. Now, sometimes students have to drop. I understand that. But other times students, they, again, they're unsure and they're like, well, I don't really know what I need to do. Uh, I don't know if I can dig out of this hole. You know, I got a D on the first paper. I don't know. We always encourage the students to talk to us. Again, I know, you know, depending on where you, you know, came from and what students you dealt with, sometimes students, they go home to their parents and the parents would say, oh, that's ridiculous. You need to do this and this and this. Many of our students here, they don't have parents that went to college. They don't have siblings that went to college. So they really don't know. So that's one of the things that we're always doing is, in a sense, teaching them how to be college students. That's one of the things that we're doing. Uh, Wichita State University, I always like to mention this. What they did, um, and I was at, at a conference where they were presenting this research, they looked at the lowest rated instructors, and these were on numerical scores. And then they looked at the written comments for these lowest rated instructors. And I think that this busts some myths, because one myth, I, it, that, which is obviously a myth, is sort of like, well, students don't like teachers that are hard, okay? That's really not true. The reason they didn't like them, two reasons. They didn't like instructors because they were unfair or because they were unkind, right? Now, to me, both of those, those are very much in our wheelhouse, right? That's exactly what we can change. Now, frankly, I mean, as a dean, we all sometimes get new faculty members. To be honest, they're boring, okay? That's what students say, they're like, yeah, this is boring. I can work with boring. OK, we've had plenty of instructors that are boring and they learn to be better. OK, then they're not as boring. Uh, if they're mean, I can't work with mean uh, as a dean. People that come in and are mean to students and don't like students, those people don't last here, you know, to be honest. So the lowest rated instructors, unfair and unkind. Please be fair. You need to treat students fairly. They definitely can see when that's not true. And then the other one is unkind. Uh, I mean, again, I, I kind of do it as somebody who's a kindergarten teacher that doesn't like kids. Uh, if you don't like college students, if you don't like this age, this is probably not the right job for you. I mean, hopefully this is really exciting. Uh, I've been teaching for a very, very long time. Um, I was much younger when I started. I'm much older now and I'm much older than the students. The students say the same age, but I keep getting older and older. I like this age group. It's just, it's a fun age group. They're very open to things. They're very uh, interested. Um, very rarely you have somebody who says, oh, I know all that. They, they're, they're humble and they're willing to learn. Okay, so the syllabus, the big one. Okay, the syllabus is a contract. That's how you should really treat the syllabus as a contract. It's a contract between you and the students. And it really says, this is what I will do. And this is what you will do. And students can't complain unless you change the syllabus. So you have to be very, very careful about changing the syllabus. I mean, I remember a faculty member, this was years ago, who uh, this was a graduate class. And he had given an assignment and everyone did really, really well on the first assignment. And so later on in the semester, he said, well, I'm going to throw out that first assignment because everyone did really well. Well, can't do that. I mean, I had a, this, this student that I was talking to who filed a great appeal said, well, 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 wait a minute. If I had included that, I would have had an A, but now I have a B because you threw that out and you threw it out for absolutely arbitrary reasons. It's like, well, everyone done well. I'm not going to count it. You, you, you can't do that. Um, so it is a contract. Now, there are weird things that happen. I mean, occasionally we do have hurricanes. We'll sometimes have class stopped for, you know, two, three days, and you're going to have to adjust. 
And sometimes weird things happen. This is obviously a very, very strange semester. Sometimes you can, but you have to approach that very, very carefully. So think about the syllabus as a contract. It needs to be clear, it needs to be unambiguous, and it needs to be fair. Okay. Uh, again, there's horror stories of faculty members that have not been fair. There was one actually just a few years ago where this was first year students and they could participate in the first year research conference. And then he said, well, you can participate in the first year research conference and it will be um, extra credit. And then a week later, he got angry with the class. So he said, yeah, well, I'm not going to do that. No more extra credit. So, so you can participate in it, but you're not giving extra credit. OK, so some students decided, well, I'm going to participate in the first year research conference anyway. They did. And then he said, well, because you did, I'm going to go ahead and give you the extra credit points. It's totally unfair. You can't you can't do that after you said no, you can't do that for some students and not for others. When that was pointed out to them, he threw a big hissy fit that he no longer works there. Uh, it needs to be fair and again, as clear and unambiguous as possible. And I can tell you my syllabus and I've been using, you know, a variation of the same syllabus over years. I don't have an original thought in my syllabus. My syllabus is cobbled together from other syllabi that I've seen where I read something. And I'm like, oh, that's pretty good. I'm going to use that. Oh, that's pretty good. I'm going to use that. Why? Because I write it some way and it's actually not as clear as I think it's going to be. So I'll look at somebody else's. So please do that. You know, look, look at others. Uh, student grade appeals. Student grade appeals are not good. OK, I mean, I can say this as a department chair. I can say this as a dean. I can say this as a faculty member. Part of a student grade appeal is somebody has to lose. If there's a grade appeal, somebody loses. That's not good. It's not good if it's a student who loses. It's not good if it's a faculty member who loses. Both of those are bad. It used to be done at the university. Never. Now it's done at the college level. OK. But grade appeals are to be avoided. And most of the time they are avoided. I mean, I can't tell you how many faculty, I mean, students at the end of the semester, they've sent some to me and they're like, well, you gave me a B, but I think I deserved an A because of this and this. And I write back and I'm like, well, these are your grades. This is what I think. That's the last I ever hear about. It. And again, what we do, we just avoided a grade appeal. So I think I got this. I go, well, these are your scores. Tell me if these are wrong. And they're like, oh, OK. Um, other times they'll say, um, you know, I wrote this paper. You gave it a C. I think this paper is really an A. OK, the student can never win that argument. OK, unless. You know, another student turns in exactly the same paper, which is plagiarism, by the way, and, and, and somehow one is an A and one is a C. But that's not true. You are the expert, so you should definitely know this. You are the expert. And as the expert, you, you, you're the expert in the class. If a student, so I think this is an A paper and you say it's a C paper, it's a C paper, period. Okay. The way that students win great appeals, and they hardly ever win great appeals, by the way, is changing the syllabus. I mean, it's really it's acting unfairly or it's changing the syllabus. You, you can't do those things. Other than that, though, students don't win great appeals, but great appeals are usually ended before they actually go to the final step, which is a great appeals committee. The very first step is they talk with the faculty member. I would say 80 to 90 percent of the time it can be cleared up right then. Students say, well, I think I deserve this. And you say, well, this is what I think. And then they're like, all right, that's it. That's it. Or if the students say, I still think I'm right. Then they go to the department chair and they make their case to the department chair. The department chair cannot change the grade. It's the faculty members opportunity to change the grade. But what the chair is, is sort of a neutral party and they'll look at both cases. They'll talk to the student. They'll talk to the faculty member. And if they believe the faculty member will lose a grade appeal, they will say that they'll say, uh, I think you better think about changing the grade here because uh, you don't want to lose this. And as a faculty member, yeah, you don't want to lose a grade appeal. It looks bad. I mean, you, in, in sense, if you lose a grade appeal, you made a mistake. Um, but the department chair, almost all the time, 80 to 90% of the time, they'll support the faculty member and then they'll tell the student, nope, I think the faculty member's right because of this and this and this. The last step is to appeal to the associate dean and then a college grade appeal committee is constituted and then they will evaluate. Uh, we're the largest college, College of Liberal Arts. We have one a year, two a year maybe, uh, that actually go to the final step. Uh, we've never had a student uh, win. A great appeal. Um, and again, most of the time, the students will see, oh, I really can't win, and then they stop. That's good. Or sometimes a faculty member will say, okay, I guess, you know, I, I made a mistake, and then they change the grade. Okay, that's to be avoided too. So again, we don't like student grade appeals. Uh, now, every college has some, 
So sometimes they can be, you know, they, they can't be avoided, but you want to try to avoid them if you can, because like I said, somebody loses and we don't really want anybody to lose. All right, some of the must haves in the syllabus, all right, that a syllabus must have. One, it has to have all contact information. It has to have your name, your office, your office hours, your email, and your phone number. That it, it has to have that. And office hours, typically, I mean, you can check with your department chair. It might be a little bit different, and certainly it's different this semester. Normally, it's five hours over three different days. Um, I mean, I've had people all do sorts of crazy things, like I'll do seven to eight in the morning when there's no students. I mean, you, you want to try to do it, obviously, where it's convenient for you, you know, like before or after class, but you also want to make it, you know, available for students. The contact information absolutely needs to be in there. Student learning outcomes, you need at least three, you know, and we usually call those, you know, SLOs, student learning outcomes. Has to be three, sometimes classes have more than that, but you have to have at least three student learning outcomes. They need to be clear and measurable. So something like this, upon completion of the course, the student will be able to name and discuss at least three causes of low US voter turnout, okay? Is that measurable? Yes, I mean, that, if that's the question on the exam, either they do it or they don't do it. That's pretty good. They need to be clear. They need to be measurable. Uh, here's a bad one. The student will learn to appreciate political science. If I'm teaching political science. I say, well, they're going to learn to appreciate political science. Uh, that's much more difficult to measure. However, upon completion of the course, you'll be able to name and discuss three causes. OK, that's that's measurable. That's the kind of thing we're talking about. So student learning outcomes, it has to be something that's measurable. It has to be something that in the beginning of the semester they don't have. And at the end of the semester, they do have. You know, what have they gained during the semester? Now, I also, I believe in words like appreciate, you know, learning to appreciate. I believe in those. They're just not appropriate for student learning outcomes, meaning they're not really measurable. Now, I also believe, I mean, I, I had some classes in college where I didn't even really get some of the things the professor was saying until years after, three years after, five years after. Student course evaluation is not going to pick that up. Student learning outcome is not going to pick that up. So I can appreciate words like that. I can appreciate larger, grander goals. They're just not appropriate for a student learning outcome. Major course requirements. This is also a must have in terms of exams, projects, assignments, et cetera. What's going to be in this class in terms of exams, projects, assignment? How many? exams are there going to be, how many assignments, et cetera, that should be in there. So a student really needs to know what are they signing up for. That's really the key to a syllabus. If there's required readings, is there's a textbook that's required, what is that textbook? If there's readings that are required, what are those readings? They need to know that as well. Students, when again, sometimes they have to sign up for a class, I realize that, because it's a required class. All right, they need to do that. However, Sometimes they have options. They're like, well, you know, I got two electives. I could do this. I could do this. And you know, students should have an idea what they're getting in for. OK, so those are things in must haves. I'm continuing, right? So those are the ones contact information, student learning outcomes, major course requirements, required reading. All right, some other ones. You must have these three things. You must have a student disability statement. Again, you can get that from your administrative associate or from your department chair. You must have a student grade appeals uh, blurb on it so that students have, they have to know what they can do to get a student grade appeal. Now, my personal opinion, I don't like it, okay? I don't like having that on every syllabus. It doesn't matter what I like or what I don't like. Uh, I have one faculty member who puts it on the back of her last page of the syllabus in 10 point font. Okay, so that's her way of sticking it to the man. Uh, whatever, I mean, you're, you're checking a box. You do have to put the student grade appeals blurb on it. And then course outline or calendar, approximately where you're going to be each week. Those things are must haves. The student disability statement, again, that changes because, you know, sometimes their office changes, sometimes the director changes that blurb. But that blurb is available. It's sent out every year. So if you don't have that from your uh, administrative associate, ask and that'll be provided to you. So those are also must haves. Now, House Bill 2504, which is a Texas state law, for each course, a syllabus must be provided along with the CV of the instructor. So if you're teaching this fall and you were asked to provide a syllabus early, and I mean, I think it's in June, 
Um, you might have been unhappy about that. Well, you're you're not alone. Uh, but this is a law. So the law is we have to have a syllabus online and a CV of the instructor online. The CV is pulled from digital measures, though, uh, and you, I'm sure you got that in some other uh, session. Digital measures, uh, you know, there is a CV that you can pull from digital measures. Now, most faculty that I know have two CVs, like I have two CVs. I have the one that you can pull from digital measures, but then I have another one that's in Word that, you know, just looks better. I, it's got some bold face in and things like that, and it's just organized a little bit more professional. It's not that big a deal to, to create two, and most faculty do have two. But the one that they pull is the one from uh, digital measures, which is fine. Now, I think you have to kind of go with the spirit of the law. This is what I've always told faculty. If you turn in a syllabus in June, like this, what you're going to be for the fall, does that mean you cannot ever change anything on that syllabus? That's not what it means. Um, because again, sometimes things change. You know, um, you know, a new article comes out and you're like, well, I'd really like the students to read this, et cetera. But you have to operate within the spirit of the law. Um, now, I'm not, I'm not sure that the Texas legislature would agree with me. Yeah, I just work within the spirit. That's how I view it, though. Meaning, what's the point of having the syllabus ready months early? It's so students know what kind of course they're signing up for. That you need, That's the spirit of the law. So students know what's going on. So what I can't do is have a syllabus in June. that say, well, I'm going to have uh, five exams and uh, four papers. And then August comes and I'm like, yeah, I thought about that, but I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to have a midterm and a final and uh, one paper. That you can't do because this, that's not what the students signed up for. Now, again, if I'm going to have them do, I'm making this up, you know, five readings and then five reaction papers. And one of those readings I don't like and a new one comes out in August that I want to swap, that I can do. I mean, students aren't saying, well, I took this class because of this reading. They're taking it because of what they're expected to do. And it's sort of like, okay, I got five papers and five reaction, you know, five papers to read and then five reaction papers to write. I'm like, okay, I can do that. And if one of those readings is different, that's not a big deal. Um, you know, if I was going to cover, you know, chapter eight, and now I'm going to cover chapter seven instead, and I move eight out, that's okay. It's the spirit of the law, meaning students need to know what they're signing up for. As long as you don't make drastic changes, again, minor changes, because sometimes, you know, I know faculty resist that. They say, I don't really like the idea of creating a syllabus months before I'm ready to teach, because many people are tweaking it at the last minute. Tweaking it is okay, but major changes you really you can't do that uh, all right optional that's what those must-haves are just what they sound like they're must-haves you've got to have those these are things that you can have in the syllabus or you could choose not to have in the syllabus it's kind of up to you uh, attendance late work makeup exams extra credit laptop usage etc some faculty have that in their syllabi some do not some faculty have two page syllabi, some faculty have 13 page syllabi, okay? What's better? I mean, there's once I'm on the briefer side, my, my syllabi is usually two pages and then a calendar, so three. Uh, I've never had a student complaint, you know, in 30 years, that, you know, or a grievance. And so, you know, the idea of the sort of like, well, this has to be a legal binding document of 20 pages. I don't think that's necessarily true either. However, that's totally up to the faculty member. As long as it's clear and it's unambiguous, you're OK. But whether you want to put that kind of stuff in there, that's up to you. Academic integrity or plagiarism. There are statements uh, that you can get from um, the Student Engagement and Success Office. Uh, some faculty have that, some do not. Whether you want to have that or not, that's totally up to you in terms of integrity or plagiarism. However, just so you know, this is not like, well, I'm, I'm ignorant of the law, so I'm <laughs> exonerated. That is not true. If you don't have anything in your syllabus about plagiarism, the students are still held to, you know, those standards. I mean, there are student code of conduct, and if the students, if they've memorized the code of conduct, if they haven't memorized the code of conduct, it doesn't matter. They are responsible for the code of conduct. And so academic, like cheating and plagiarism are not good. Now, do know in terms of ac academic integrity, which is cheating, and plagiarism, okay? Plagiarism, I mean, for each of those, if you are accusing a student of academic integrity, which is cheating, or plagiarism, if you are doing that as a faculty member, the burden of proof is on you as the instructor. In my opinion, and this is based on past experience, proving plagiarism, that's pretty easily done. 
I mean, you, just, you know, it's like, well, here's a block. It's exactly from this document that I found on Google, and here it is. I mean, a student really, they have no argument against that. Okay, plagiarism is very easily proven. Academic integrity or cheating, that is difficult to prove. Um, it just is difficult. It's sort of like, well, your answers are similar to another student's. That, that's not proving it. So if you've got questions, I would talk to somebody in student engagement and success. But just realize that the burden of proof is on you if you're going to accuse a student of either one of those. But you do not have to have that in your syllabus. Students are still responsible. Dropping a class. Again, many faculty, as I said, will ask students, please come see me before dropping a class. But students do not have to drop you just before they, I mean, don't have to see you before they drop a class. Classroom or professional behavior statement of civility. Sometimes this is a problem. Sometimes it's not. Uh, some uh, faculty like to put that in the syllabus. Other ones do not. You know, partly that depends on what kind of class it is. Um, but that's totally up to you. Uh, college advising in College of Liberal Arts. We require an advising statement um, just like. Uh, you know, the uh, great appeals or student disabilities. Liberal arts says you must see an advisor. This is what your advisor does, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Other colleges do not have that though. That's optional what the faculty member wants to do. And then statement of academic continuity. Academic continuity is what happens if we are unable to hold classes on campus. Obviously that's a possibility. I mean, you know, if the virus got significantly worse, uh, might there make a call? to you know, cease all on-campus or face-to-face -face teaching? Yes, they might, it's possible. Uh, hurricane, that's mostly why we have it, um, academic continuity. If a hurricane came in, um, what would happen? Um, we've never been closed for more than just a few days, um, but is it possible? Yes, and there are classes that would be able to be continued very easily, just move online. Other ones, uh, dance classes, for example, uh, they're not as easily moved online, um, but we might be able to, you know, use a studio and I don't know. I mean, depending on where the hurricane hit, Alice, Texas, or uh, Beeville, or I mean, I, I I don't know. But a statement of academic continuity, you can have one if you want. I think most faculty do not, but you're you're welcome to do that as well. All right, so those are optional things that you can have on your syllabi. All right, some academic resources in terms of what's available on campus, okay? Um, if you are having you know, difficulty, if you've got questions, if you've got struggles, et cetera, uh, probably your best place to go is your colleagues. Um, I would be very surprised if senior colleagues haven't had something like what you're struggling with. Um, and that's just you know, sort of like, yeah, I got a student who's kind of doing this. What, 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 what do you think? Um, it's one of the very, very uh, best resources that you can have. And it's very available. I mean, these are people that are, you know, next door to you and you say, hey, I've kind of had this, uh, you know, what do you think? So please use your colleagues uh, to help. Uh, sometimes I know, uh, sometimes faculty are like, well, I should be able to handle this myself. It's like, uh, no, you should. Um, you know, if you've got questions, when I was department chair, there was another department chair and he and I were talking all the time. Uh, he would come over and he go, Mark, I, I, I got a faculty member that's asking this. Uh, is that crazy? And I was like, yeah, that, that's crazy. And he's like, thank you. That's, that's what I thought it was. But we were checking with each other all the time. And faculty do that all the time. You know, well, I've got this student here. What do you think? So please use your colleagues. Uh, your department chairs also. Department chairs also, they have a, they have a great deal of experience um, teaching. One of the reasons that they are department chairs is they've kind of been able to handle problems. They don't uh, they don't overreact. They don't underreact. They, they react appropriately. So if you've got some questions, go to your department chair. Um, that's that's what you would want to do. And what you want is you want your department chair support. That's important. OK, what you don't want to do, you, you don't want to, you know, hold a line with a student. And then the student goes to the department chair and then the department chair comes back to you and says, what, what are you doing? You want your department chair to support you. So if you've got sort of a difficult decision to make, run this by your chair because you don't want to be the chair does not want to be put in the position of supporting a student over a faculty member. They, they don't want to do that. Um, so just you know, run this by uh, the department chairs, especially if it's a very difficult or you know maybe a controversial decision or something like that. Run it by them. Uh, academic advisors. Um, I think academic advisors are underused. Some faculty use them a lot. Uh, I always use them a lot. Um, department chairs use them a lot um, because academic advisors know 
sometimes why students are taking this class or why they're taking this class. How come students are not taking this class and not taking this? I mean, we can poll students, but that's difficult to do and it's very time consuming. Academic advisors sometimes know a great deal about what students are thinking and what students are feeling. So if you've got some questions, um, and again, there's a lot of different reasons you would ask about an academic advisor. In fact, you know, you might say something like, you know, I'm thinking, um, you know, this class that I typically teach once a year, I'm thinking of offering it every semester. Uh, you know, do you think we'd get the enrollment for that? That's the person to ask. That's in fact, that's the only person to ask is the academic advisor. And if you ask the department chair, I'll tell you what the department chair is going to do, <laughs> ask the academic advisor. So skip the middle person and just go right to the academic advisor. Okay, then there's CASA, the Center for Academic Student Achievement. Okay, CASA, it is kind of catty corner from the library. It's kind of behind, um, you know, Center for Science uh, to degree. That's where CASA is. Yeah, it's behind the Center for the Science. And that is really the tutoring center. Some people call it the tutoring center, but it's technically CASA. CASA is very, very good. If you are struggling with you know, teaching a particular class, you know, talk to somebody in cost and say, and just say that, just say, hey, I'm, I'm really struggling in this class. Uh, what can I do? We have supplemental instruction for some classes. We don't have supplemental instruction for all classes. We can't do that. We don't, we don't have enough resources to do that. But they have student tutors. They kind of want to know where are students struggling and how can they best help students? Um, this was years ago. I don't know if this has changed, but the average student that sought help at CASA, their GPA was like 3.4 or something like that. I can't remember exactly what it was. It was way higher than what you'd think. And you know what that means? It means the good students were seeking it out because it's like, oh yeah, I want some tutoring. I'm kind of struggling. The students that were really struggling, you know, with C's and D's were not going there. That's really been our challenge and we are doing better and better trying to get those students in. But CASA is a good academic resource for where are students struggling and what can they do to help you? And then there's the Center for Faculty Excellence. And obviously you are, you know, in the midst of the Center for Faculty Excellence now. I mean, that's, uh, you know, Kelly is the director of the Center for Faculty Excellence. They have, and, you know, Kelly probably explained this to you, they have multiple presentations during the year. Those, those presentations are created and originated based on faculty interest. If faculty say, you know, I would really like something about teaching large classes. You know, how do I get 150 students engaged? Are there ways to do that? How can I use writing across the curriculum? How can I do it? How can I create civil discussions in classroom? I try to get students to discuss in class and they won't do it. How can I increase classroom discussion? All of those are things that faculty struggle with make those suggestions please to CFE and then they often will have opportunities for you to go to these sessions led by uh, you know experienced faculty who will talk about some of the ideas that they've had sometimes they're individual presentations sometimes they're panel discussions but center for faculty excellence is another one too if I'm struggling in this area ask them they're, they're going to be able to help you out uh, some other resources continue student engagement and success Okay. They used to be called student affairs. That's what they are on many campuses. They used to be called student affairs here. Now it's student engagement and success. It's SEAS, S-E-A-S. So when you hear that acronym SEAS, that's what it is. It's student engagement and success. Within student engagement and success, there is eye care. Okay. And eye care is really a student resource. And so it's important to know what they can and what they can't do. What they are doing is balancing student rights and faculty concerns. Um, I'll be real honest here. There have been some faculty in the past that have said, oh, I, I never use eye care. They don't do anything. Well, that's not true. It's in a sense, it's a misunderstanding of what eye care can do. If I have a student that I believe is homeless, let's say I believe that uh, she's living in her car, then I would refer her to eye care. And then eye care reaches out to that student and says, these are the resources that are available on campus to help you. If I have a student that I believe is suffering from depression, is suffering from anxiety, et cetera, I might contact eye care. Eye care reaches out to the student and provides the student resources. If I have a student in my class that's a pain in the neck, 
okay, who is disruptive, who sits in the front and interrupts me all the time, there's no point in me going to eye care. Eye care is connecting students with resources. That's why some faculty said, well, eye care don't do anything because I had a very difficult student and they didn't do anything. That's because they're advocates for the student. Okay, now they're advocates for faculty too, but um, some faculty think it's sort of like, oh, I don't really like this student. I want the student out of my class. Uh, you can't do that. Um, the this, this student has rights too. Now, that's not to say there is a code of conduct. And if students are violating that code of conduct, they need to be held on that. If they are really disrupting class, then they need to be told, yes, you, you're disrupting class. And they cannot do that. So there is a code of conduct. It's not like there isn't anything. However, I care. You should know I care is connecting students with resources to help students. That's really what it's for. Now, there's also student conduct. And as I said, there's a student code of conduct, which is published. And so students need to follow the student code of conduct, even if it's not in the syllabus, and even if they don't have a, you know, a copy of it. It's the same thing. I mean, if you don't know that, there's a faculty handbook. You are expected to know everything in the faculty handbook. I'm a dean. I have not read everything in the faculty handbook, but I have read the parts that are particularly important. And when something comes up, it's right there on the home page. It's way better than when we had all when it was a paper version and you'd get new pieces of paper every few weeks. I mean, that was a nightmare. So this having an updated version, Kevin Houlihan is the one who maintains it. It's right on the website. If you've got questions, you go right there. If somebody asks me a question, I don't know, that's where I go. I go to the faculty handbook. Students is the same thing. This is the student code of conduct. This is what students can do. This is what students cannot do. I've had questions like this too, where faculty will contact me or department chair will contact me and they said, uh, you know, I've got a student who's doing this. Can a student do that? You know what I do? I call over to the student conduct office. Okay. Uh, Andy Gage is the dean of students. Uh, Angela Walker is a conduct officer. I usually call one of them and I ask them, I said, this is what's going on. What, what can we do? And they're very, very helpful. What they want is the best experience for the students and for the faculty. So if a student is getting out of line, they'll tell you this is exactly what you can do. Again, you don't want to kind of overreach. And they take things very, very seriously. I mean, I've had at least four or five cases where they have gone to the DA downtown and said, what can we do? Can we do this? Can we not do this? And so it's not that they're just sort of making crazy decisions. They are following the law. What can we do? What can we not do? If we, you know, if we really ban a student from campus, can we do that? Uh, I mean, it is a public place. We can, but only under certain circumstances. Again, those are in the extreme situations. But there is a student code of conduct. If students are violating it, they can get in trouble. But exactly what that is, I mean, I have never read the student code of conduct, I admit. Um, I've never really found the need to do that, but it is available and students are expected to do that. I think it's much easier to call somebody over in C's and say, this is the problem. I got a student doing this and then they're gonna give you options. They're gonna try to help you out. All right, then there's also, this is sort of the highest level is employee development and compliance services. Um, I would bet you, eh, it just popped into my head, at least 75% of the campus would not be able to name that. They know that office is <laughs> Sam and Rose because uh, they've been working there a very, very long time. And that's when you have a formal grievance that you wish to file. Um, this is obviously very, very serious to do this. Um, employee development and compliance, it's almost the last resort. It's sort of like, you know, I've gone to my department chair, I've gone to the dean, I've gone to student engagement success, no one helps me, this is outrageous, that's where you go. You go to employee development and compliance services, Sam Ramirez or Rosie Ruiz. Um, there also is, we have an ombuds um, on campus. Um, used to be called uh, an ombudsman. And then it was kind of like, oh, let's see if we get some gender neutral language. Uh, but apparently ombuds person is not really a term. Uh, so the term is just ombuds. And so we do have an ombuds. The ombuds is Andy Piker. And an ombuds is really the step before employee development and compliance services. Um, Andy Piker is the one, again, he's the ombuds. And if you have concerns, he's the one to see. He's a professional mediator. He's a faculty member, he's a faculty member in philosophy, and he's ombuds part-time, well, half-time. And what he does is he talks with students, staff, and faculty, anybody. 
If they've got a concern, they go to Andy Piker and they say, all right, this is my concern, this and this and this and this and this. And then they say, you know, they might say something like, you know, I wish to file a grievance. And he will just give you his opinion. He just says, I think uh, that's probably not the best way to do it. Or he might say, well, yeah, I think that that really is the best solution here. Or he will try to talk it out. I mean, it's almost like, again, you know, a great appeal, like a grievance. Um, you know, some universities have a grievance office and they have 200 grievances a week. We do not have that. Our grievances are much less frequent than that. And I think in some ways that's, <coughs> excuse me, because the system works the way it's supposed to work, which is what we try to do is to work things out beforehand. So it's kind of like, uh, you know, I believe that, uh, you know, this department chair is not treating me fairly. I went to the dean, nothing happened. Go to the ombuds and say, yeah, this is what I think. Uh, is this, you know, is this, is this reasonable? Um, same thing in terms of, you know, teaching problems. Um, and this is, again, I'm thinking of teaching in the broadest sense. It could be, um, well, you know, I uh, believe that, you know, I really should only be teaching these classes and I'm teaching these classes. Is that fair? Um, I have a student who continues to do this. Do I have to be able to allow, you know, this student to talk in class, et cetera? Doesn't it? There are lots of resources. So, as I said, student engagement success is there for you. Employee development compliance services. I mean, Sam and Rosie's office. That's kind of extreme. Again, if you want to file a formal complaint or file a formal grievance. And then I don't have it on the slide. I, I that was my fault. I should have done that, which is the ombuds, which is Andy Piker. I will put that on the slide, though, that goes to uh, Kelly. So you'll have those uh, resources there. Uh, that's the end of what I have. Let's see if I can uh, stop sharing. Hey, look at that. Okay, I did. So, um, if anybody uh, uh, has a question, I'd be happy to uh, uh, try to answer it. I am uh, always available, um, you know, obviously uh, Kelly is as well, you know, I'm always responding to email. Uh, it's not like, you know, I, I don't respond. Uh, open door uh, policy, again, if, if somebody wants to see me, they can. Um, but like I said, I will um, uh, give this newest version to Kelly. In fact, I'm gonna email it to her right now and then she will have that available. And then uh, you're, you're, you're welcome to, uh, you know, look it up. Uh, Etc. And like I said, and if you've got questions, I'll try to put the contact information on uh, on the slides too, which I didn't have before. I just so you know where those are on campus. Um, but uh, if you don't have any questions, uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I did. I really welcome all of you to campus again. I know this is a really really crazy uh, semester. This is the first time we've ever done new faculty orientation virtually. Uh, it's not like in person, but uh, you know, I, I hope that you still uh, got something out of it and still, uh, you know, raring to go this semester. All right. Well, thanks very much, and have Mark. A thanks very much. Okay. Thanks, Kelly. We'll see you soon. Thank you for okay. the, your time and the info. All right. Thanks, All right, everybody. Bye. We have about thirty minutes before our next session that starts at twelve fifteen. Uh, that will be the research and innovation virtual luncheon. So you have time to get away, get away, get up, uh, walk around, uh, maybe bring some food back for the luncheon. And then after that, uh, after Colleen and Ahmed Mahdi uh, give their presentation on research and innovation, then you will go to your individual college breakouts for the rest of the afternoon from two to five. So this really concludes the portion that the CFE is facilitating. I will uh, say hi to all of you in the research and innovation portion. Um, but I do want to let you know that I'll be sending out a lot of resources to all of you. Uh, we realize that this is a time where A, there's a lot of uncertainty, but B, there's also a lot of overload of information. So we have put a ton of resources online, including videos that introduce you to various departments and members across campus that you can view at your leisure uh, when it's convenient for you, uh, just to help get you help get you familiar with a lot of the departments around campus. So um, I hope you all will reach out to us. Uh, my contact information is everywhere. You have my email address. I'm typically always on my phone. So um, have a great day. 
Um, hope you all have have enjoyed this as as much as you can possibly enjoy an orientation. And I look forward to actually seeing you in person on campus. So take care of yourselves, stay healthy, stay well. And again, welcome to the Island University. I hope you all have a great rest of your week.